49 countries have now committed to a net zero target by 2050. Another 40 have indicated they will set similar targets. But are the policies they're setting out honest and will they work? One key part of the mix is carbon capture and storage. It's a technology that's existed for 50 years and it forms a major part of many countries' plans to get to net zero. And yet today, globally, we capture barely 0.1% of what we emit and we need to be capturing at least 10% by 2030. So let's speak to Professor Stuart Hazeldean. He's from the Edinburgh University. He's one of the world's foremost experts on carbon capture and storage. Professor, it's lovely to have your expertise on the programme. I mean, tell me first and foremost, this, this technology that we've had for 50 years, does it work? Yes, it's been working since uh, the 1970s in many applications worldwide, but not all focused on climate uh, mitigation. It's used often in oil refineries, used often in natural gas production, but there's no doubt that millions of tonnes a year can be captured, transported and stored safely underground by this type of technology. So why has it not been rolled out more widely than is the case at the moment? So you're quite right that uh, we're way behind on this type of uh, action because in all of the climate simulations and modelling of how to get to net zero, carbon capture and storage is essential for the last 20%. It's the most difficult 20% that this helps you with. But what I think gov we're stuck with the uh, political inaction and the market inaction which has not been led by governments so governments need to get on the front foot and try innovating this and try making this to be business as usual in their countries and that means doing slightly tough things like either putting a tax or a price on carbon dioxide emissions so that it's cheaper to capture or at the alternative end just saying that we're not going to place a price on it you the oil and gas and coal producers you have to store one one tonne of carbon for every tonne of carbon you produce. It's only that way we're going to get into the arithmetic balance of the carbon emission with the carbon take-back obligation, which has to make it work. So it's putting the obligation on the emitters, but it's also ensuring that for those who develop the technology, there's a profit and an incentive to get more and more companies using it, correct? Correct, because nothing in our industrial societies really works for very long unless it makes a profit. But that's not as difficult as it sounds, because if the uh, tax is included or the obligation, the cost of disposal of CO2 is included in the price that we all pay for the fundamental product, the, the uh, petrol or the diesel or the gas which goes to form the electricity we use in our homes, then actually that fundamental product, the oil, gas or coal, is only a tiny amount of what we end up paying. So that if we wanted to store all the carbon dioxide from one litre of petrol, for example, that would only cost about another 15 pence a litre. And we've just seen petrol rise by 15 pence a litre in uh, most of Europe. So this is well within the bounds of possibility. But with the politicians have to be bold enough to grab that and to make that happen. So what this summit needs to do is get into actions, not just evasive promises. Countries need to work together to make definite plans with dates and amounts of carbon dioxide decreased and captured. And those plans, I think, should be published every year. Five years gap between the ratchet is too slow, too slow. And we need to get faster, faster and accelerate. Yeah, it's a very important point. In fact, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, who's now a UN envoy and gathering, corralling, if you will, world finance, has talked about this. And we're going to talk to him on Tuesday here uh, about carbon capture and how he's going to get money behind it. Can I talk yeah. to you about some of the technicalities, though? And, it's, and do sure. excuse my ignorance, because I don't fully understand the technology. But is it just about capping and taking off the emissions from coal and gas? Or can this technology be used to actually suck carbon dioxide out of the general atmosphere? Well, it can be applied to both those and also multiple other actions. Uh, so it's traditionally, if you like, been thought of as a technology which can uh, reduce and decrease and capture emissions from electricity generation by coal or by methane gas. But it's very clear uh, that we have uh, large amounts of carbon dioxide emitted from 
industries, our fundamental big industries, not just chemical industries, but also making steel, making cement, making fertilizer, all of those emit carbon dioxide. And the UK actually is leading the world on trying to show a pathway of how to use carbon capture to decrease those emissions. So we've, we in the UK announced uh, two weeks ago uh, how to, that to the two of our large regions would be decarbonizing and try to get to zero carbon around 2040. And also, as you mentioned, in addition to that, the third aspect of carbon capture and storage is that you can indeed capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere around us. So that's been done. There are several pilot plants and which are just starting off. That's at a more experimental stage, but that technology definitely works. We can separate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and slowly reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and put that back underground. But that's expensive and it means a lot of construction. So the first things to do are to become more efficient then to capture the carbon dioxide from making electricity, then to capture carbon dioxide from the industries and the heat that we use. And then last of all, do that direct air capture, which you just talked about. It sounds promising with the right amount of financing. Where are we going to put all this carbon that we suck out of the atmosphere? So that's a great question. And, and again, we've we in the University of Edinburgh and the UK as a whole and many other countries worldwide and oil and gas companies have done a lot of research and development work on this literally since uh, to the year 2000. So we've got 20 years of understanding about how to do this. And the answer to that, your question, is that by capturing carbon dioxide, we can then pressurize it to make it into a liquid, just like in a fire extinguisher, the carbon dioxide is liquid, and then pipeline that using an oil and gas pipe type of pipeline to inject deep down into the porous tiny pores in the rock deep beneath the North Sea or deep beneath the ground in any place which has had oil and gas extracted from it where there are very, very abundant sandstone layers which can take back that carbon dioxide and also have impermeable layers of rock on the top like a, like a roof, a slate roof, which stops the carbon dioxide from leaking out. So we know that we can put carbon dioxide into the ground and we know that uh, we can have uh, a 50% certainty this is slightly difficult, 50% certainty that 98%, i.e. slightly, practically all of the carbon dioxide will stay there for 10,000 years into the future. So it's actually by far the best and by far the simplest and by far the cheapest way of storing and taking away huge tonnages of carbon dioxide. And, it, and, it, and, it, and we don't think it will leach out. I mean, it's interesting that you talk well, we, about we, the, the, the way we, we can store this and where we put it. I mean, we are hugely experienced now, incredibly talented, in fact, at drilling for oil in even yeah. the most difficult positions. So why are we not incentivizing the oil and gas companies to start drilling these boreholes and we pay them for that to store the carbon that, of course, their product creates? Uh, I think that's a very appropriate question and the, again the answer to that is that in Europe and indeed in the UK still we're focused on trying to reduce emissions so that if you want to if you're a big industry and you want to carry on emitting carbon dioxide you pay money and you buy a permit to carry on polluting and I think that's the wrong way round what we need to do is pay the oil and gas companies who have the technology or pay any company who wants to get involved in injecting and storing carbon dioxide so we need to focus a lot more on creating that market for storage of carbon dioxide because that's what will benefit us all and we can do that either by as I said creating very very large amounts of tax literally hundreds or thousands of, of dollars per ton of carbon dioxide tax which will then make everything really really expensive or we can focus on telling oil companies and coal companies and carbon producers that this is what they have to do if they want to operate in our country. So that obligation is placed on the companies so that if they have the technology to bring carbon out of the ground, they have to find and develop the technology which they all do now already have. They develop the technology to put the carbon back into the ground and that cost of putting the carbon into the ground ultimately will be paid by small increases of price to us, the consumers. 
because at the moment we're effectively behaving as if instead of putting our rubbish in wheelie bins and having it taken away by the council, that was that's the smart thing to do, what we're presently all doing is having our carbon dioxide and just dumping it in the street outside our house. So we're not paying the true price of clearing up the consequences of our carbon habits. Yeah, it's going to require enormous social changes as well as political not changes. As much, uh, not as much, not enormous, I think, no, but very doable. Thank you very much. It's very doable and you can do it almost invisibly. It's a good starter for 10 on a, an issue that we're going to be talking about an awful lot, I think, over the course of the next yeah. two weeks. Stuart Hazeldean, yeah. thank you very much indeed for your time.